This podcast is brought to you by the American Enterprise Institute. If you like what you hear, please subscribe, rate, review, and share. Thanks for listening. Here's our show. What in the hell's going on? What the hell is going on? What the hell is going on? I don't know what the hell he's talking about. You don't have to know what the hell is on it. What the hell's the matter with these guys? We don't know what's going on. What the hell's going on? Who in God's name knows what it's all about? Hi, I'm Danielle Platka. And I'm Mark Thiessen. Welcome to our podcast, What the Hell is Going On? Mark, what the hell? What the hell is right? I, I've I've never been sadder recording a podcast and watching what's unfolding in Israel right now. I just want to read you a, a tweet that just came out from someone in the region. Uh, this is says, Zaka Southern Region Head of Operations Yossi Landau said that in his long career as an emergency responder, he had never seen horrors comparing to those unleashed by Gazan terrorists Saturday. Zaka is a volunteer civilian. Uh, emergency response organization comprised of many religious Jews who help collect human remains after terrorist attacks. And this is the part that that actually hit me in the gut. In the first home he and his colleagues entered, quote, we see a pregnant lady lying on the floor and then we turn her around and see the stomach is cut open, wide open, the unborn baby still connected by the umbilical cord was stabbed with a knife and the mother was shot in the head and you can use your imagination trying to figure out what came first. Unquote. I mean, that's the monstrosity of what we're dealing with here in Israel. The people who would take a pregnant woman and cut her open and murder her unborn child and then shoot her in the head. And they did this over and over and over again. And that's not the worst atrocity that took place. Um, it's, it's just absolutely stunning. The word for it is satanic. I, I can't think of a more apt description of what's happening. And for Americans who are watching this unfold on their television screens, who don't follow the Palestinian-Israeli conflict uh, every day, are wondering what the hell is going on. And so what we decided to do was reach out uh, to a uh, a journalist in, in Israel who's been one of the most eloquent explainers of what's happening, of the roots of this conflict, why it's happening, what the ideology of the of the terrorists is, and and how we bring it to a conclusion, and we've got him here today. So Habib Retigur is our uh, guest. He's a journalist with the with the Times of Israel. You know, we see we see a lot of analysis coming out of Washington. We obviously see a lot of compassion, also a lot of outrage. Uh, as 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 you said, Mark, not often that I cry on a podcast. I mean, sometimes I cry for you because I wish that you understood things better, but I, I rarely, I rarely actually cry on a <laughs> podcast. And, uh, and the stories that Javiv told us, um, you know, and, and the thing of it is, I think that there is an element out there that says, oh, come on, you know, that happened last week. You know, yeah, disgusting. Yeah, you shouldn't, you shouldn't cut off babies' heads. You shouldn't, you shouldn't carve up pregnant women. But, you know, look at what the Israelis are doing. And the answer is no. Actually, stop. Look at what Hamas did. And I repeated this before, I think on our previous podcast, but it's the line that has stayed with me so much. You know, uh, a woman whose family was killed who said, uh, you know, if these are human beings, uh, I'm not sure what it is to be a human being anymore. The the wanton cruelty of it all. I, I will say I, I'm very grateful to Javiv because we talked not just about that, uh, and we should remind every single day, never forget what happened to these people, the torture, the suffering, the wanton cruelty that, that they were exposed to, and the 199 hostages from more than 40 different countries, babies as young as five months old, Holocaust survivors in their 90s, who are being held by those Gazans who are being celebrated on the streets of Boston, New York, and Art, and Paris, and London, and Sydney, and everywhere else. But we also discussed a few more issues that I think our listeners will really be interested in. Um, the intelligence failure, how yeah. the Israelis screwed this up so freaking royally, because they did. And we can't forget the inhumanity of Hamas does not excuse this failure. Um, ha- what the visit of Joe Biden just announced uh, means. And we have a really interesting discussion about that because I think that uh, Habib had a perspective I didn't have. What the Arabs think and what they're doing, all of those are the questions that we, we cover. And um, 
a, really a thoughtful guest. I, I appreciated so much his take. You'll note that this podcast is a little bit longer than most of our normal episodes. We asked Haviv to spend about a half an hour with us, and he ended up spending almost an hour with us. And honestly, he's so eloquent and so interesting. I could have gone on for another hour uh, and listened to him, but we uh, he, he didn't have time. He had to go off to his next interview. Uh, you will find this discussion absolutely fascinating. He's truly, in, at a time when everybody's talking about what's happening, I haven't seen anyone more eloquent or interesting yet. So, um, Danny, why don't you introduce him? Khaviv Retigur, he is the Times of Israel's senior analyst. He worked before that for the Jerusalem Post. He is an analyst of Israeli politics in more normal times and a thoughtful writer, writes in English. Um, so if anybody's interested in his work, you can just uh, you can just Google him and we'll link to some of his work in our Substack as well. But uh, I hope that you enjoy this interview as, as much as we did and learn as much from it. Here's our interview. Well, Haviv, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. So you were telling me before we came on air here that you had just spent some time talking with a crime scene investigator, that all the uh, all the crime scene investigators have been called in to go through the damage that was done by this attack. Talk to us a little bit about what you learned. Yeah, everybody's everybody's still deep in the attack. I mean, it was, I know it's 10 days later. The world has moved on multiple times already, but Israelis have not. My very good friend, who I have known many years and our kids are in school together, is a head of a crime scene investigation mobile unit in the Israel police. And he was called up by Saturday night, uh, that October 7th, by the night, the word already went out and they needed to identify bodies. They needed to identify a lot of bodies very quickly and not just to identify them, which was the urgent question because they needed, the, the police were charged with developing that database of who's dead and who's missing and who's kidnapped. They also needed to develop that initial report, professional CSI report on what, what actually happened to these people. And so he was called up and he started with helping in the collection of bodies, literally strewn in the desert, literally strewn in, in the Sderot, which is a city. He, he went with some uh, officers from that district, that police district to the Sderot police department where there was a pitched gun battle in which the officers were killed just, you know, they were, they're, they're, they're regular cops. They were carrying, you know, handguns and these essentially Hamas uh, commandos engaged them in a firefight for many hours. And so they, they found friends, they found friends lying there. They found a woman who was about to get married, an officer. And, and then he went to the body collection, essentially a kind of a cold warehouse. And his job over his job and the job of other CSI units from the police from all over the country was then to spend the next five days going body by body, 1300 bodies and figuring out how they died. And, and he, just, he describes things that are hard to listen. I don't know how, how he lived through them, but he, you know, the, there would be a body bag that would come in from the field and you don't know what you're going to get when you open it. Sometimes bodies were placed in bags with whatever clothes were around them, objects were around them. And that could have been a, uh, there were smaller bags that had either things with I, with DNA evidence on them, blood or a single body part. You know, a hand was found disconnected from a body somewhere. But the smaller bags also had the babies and the children. One of the officers in his unit, this got morbid fast. I'm, I've come here from that interview. One of the officers in his unit just had a baby and that baby is a few months old. And every time one of the small bags came in, he had to he had to go outside and breathe and he couldn't do the baby bags and the other officers said that, you know, that's a good thing. You need to know your limits. And there were, there was so much evidence of torture. There was so much evidence of, you know, you get a single body and the body would be uh, bound hand and foot and also stabbed and also burned and also shot. And that wasn't, it wasn't a killing spree. It, it was something much worse than a killing spree. And so, that is my very good friend and writing up that interview because the world needs to know he himself felt very good saying it all. So yeah, so that's, that's, we're still in it. We're deep, deep in it. This is something that, you know, if you, if you think backwards to what Jews remember, this is something we're going to remember for uh, centuries, for millennia. There's going to be religious responses to this that will last many, many generations. 
I, I, I'm grateful to you for for telling the story. I, I think you are exactly right. Um, it, we can't stop repeating this. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so upset by what I heard. Um, yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't seem to. Uh, doesn't um, seem to go away. I don't know how to even say it. There are there are bags of disconnected body parts, and there are a few people missing who we don't know that they're in Gaza. There is a discrepancy of maybe a few dozen people between the different lists who are just not found. Maybe their bodies are somewhere. Maybe you know there was a the the festival was literally in the desert, and there are just hyenas in the desert, and so it's it, there are. Discrepancies that we may, you know, Hamas may have lost people as it took them into Gaza. So there are things we'll never, there are people, families who will never have answers. But the vast majority have been found, identified, most of them also buried. Khaviv, I wanted to ask you, just sort of to, to pull out a little bit. There are so many, there are so many whys, and a lot of people are focusing on what's going to happen next. We had an event at AEI, you know, we talked about what's happening next. But... For me, one of the most persistent questions is Hamas. I've known the people of Hamas and Hamas since I interviewed Sheikh Yassin when I was a journalist, you know, more than 30 years ago. And this is not their signature. Israel has rightly likened Hamas to ISIS, but Hamas wasn't ISIS. And what I fail to understand, and maybe you have some thoughts about this, is what was the reason for for the sheer animal savagery of this attack? With, you know, with the caveat that I'm an Israeli trying to understand myself, this is what an Israeli thinks Palestinians are thinking, so. But that, that in itself is information worth knowing. What Israelis think, Palestinians think, is going to affect how this plays out. I think that the Palestinian national movement writ large has an enormous intellectual problem, an enormous intellectual cognitive dissonance that they are struggling with and it is it is eating at them. They have a vision of us and they have had it for a century. In 1913 there were members of the Jerusalem Arab elite who were sitting in the city council and they were watching the Jewish migrants coming in and these were refugees fleeing brutality in Eastern Europe. And they said, well, if they're brutalizing them there and that's making them leave, if we just do to them here, this particular member of the city council said, we'll just do to them what they do to them in Romania and then they'll leave here as well. There's been a theory of the Jewish immigration, of Zionism, of Israel, of the millions of Jews who came here over the last century, that we are colonialists. We are something, you know, some kind of imposed artificial identity pushed into this land by imperialist designs, by colonialist designs. Every Palestinian school child, every uh, Palestinian textbook focuses on this gap, this difference between the very rooted and real Palestinian identity and the very artificial, fake, not true, invented, invented by Europeans, which is the worst kind of invented Israeli or Jewish identity. And because Israel is fake, it's fate. It will be the fate of all fake things. Its fate is to collapse. It doesn't have the anchor, the rootedness of, of an authentic, true, deep... There's a lot of, you know, old German romanticism that you're hearing here. There's a lot, a lot of times when Arab discourse, Arab political and ideological discourse tries to be Arab, the most authentic version of itself. It has to borrow ideas of authenticity from European romanticism to do it. So... It's one of the ironies of the modern age. Um, it, it it sees us as this artificial thing, and it sees and the and the, this ideology, this foundational Palestinian ideology, sees the Palestinian Arab identity as true and thus as fake, and that has a policy ramification. It means that you get rid of the Jews, this great problem that has arrived on your doorstep, with the way you get rid of other colonialist, imperialist, fake nations. And you do that with massive terrorist violence. Massive terrorist violence kicked. The great example in the Palestinian education system is Algeria. The Algerians, in an eight-year, you know, violent, horrific war. By the way, the French were 
equally or maybe even more horrific in that war. Hundreds of thousands of Algerian Muslims were killed, so, you know. But nevertheless, in this horrific eight-year ter terror war, the Algerians actually forced the French out. There were a million and a half French in Algeria. They'd been there for 130 years. And then in 1962, they all leave. And that moment catalyzes the foundation of the Palestine Liberation Organization modeled on the Algerian National Liberation Front. The French were here 130 years. So it doesn't matter that the Jews have been here a long time. There were a million and a half French people, entire cities. So it doesn't matter that there's lots of Jews. This will work here and it will work there. And since 1964, but it had already been articulated, this authenticity discourse and, and, and the idea of the Jews as colonialist and imperialist agents had already been articulated before. In 1964, with the founding of the PLO, it becomes hard strategy. You can read Yasser Arafat's 1974 speech at the UN in which he's actually introduced to the podium by the president of the assembly, who is the president of Algeria, who's a former FLN leader. And... Arafat gives this speech in which he discusses Zionism as this colonialist imperialist plot. And the problem, the cognitive dissonance, is that it isn't working. It isn't working. The terror continues and it spikes during peace processes as much as during moments of stagnation. When Israel does something bad, there's terrorism. And when the Israeli liberal left wins an election where the campaign is about founding a Palestinian state, for example, in 1999, and they go to Camp David and there's Bill Clinton offering them billions of dollars just to agree. And, and they're talking about shared sovereignty on the Temple Mount and the Israeli army is pulled out of all the Palestinian cities. And we're at the height of the peace process in, in the year 2000. And then suddenly in September begins a wave of 140 suicide bombings from which the Israeli political left still has not recovered. Not, not, not because those Israelis no longer feel liberal feelings or have liberal instincts, but because they literally don't know what those bombings were about. That was the height of the peace process. And so now, you know, it's very easy for Palestinians and Palestinian supporters to say, well, this is about this terrible Israeli government, and this is about occupation, and this is about settlement growth. And you know what? I give it to them. But if they can't explain to me what the hell that was about, those 140 bombings back then, all I've experienced as an Israeli is bombings no matter what I do. And so there's this Palestinian ideology that drives this terror that is independent of Israeli action. Now, you can believe that Israelis are horrifying. You can believe that Israel is this evil, evil entity. Enjoy, you know, if it makes you happy, have fun, go for it. But the Israelis have experienced Palestinian terrorism as completely in, immune and independent to actual Israeli action on the ground. And this attack, the horror of it, the broadcasting of it, you know, the, the Assad regime sent gangs through the through the, you know, Syrian countryside to murder Sunnis in the most horrific ways imaginable throughout the Syrian civil war, and then filmed it and then uploaded it to the uh, social media networks. And the reason the Assad regime wanted to show Alawites massacring Sunnis is because it created a hatred among Sunnis for Alawites, who are Assad's people, that made the Alawites have to stick with Assad. Because if the Alawites lost that war, that civil war, the Sunnis would massacre them. This felt like that. Hamas was trying to create unspeakable hatred. Hamas was trying to terrorize. I, I'm going to, I guess, answer the question in a sentence after giving that speech. I apologize for how long that took. The Palestinian theory of us is that we can be kicked out with massive violence. The violence is independent of what we actually do. This theory says that any peace agreement with us is a betrayal of the great hope of actual liberation from us completely, that we can actually be completely pushed out. It never works. And so there are two Palestinian reactions. Every time there's a terror wave, Israelis unify, and they win, and they grow. And so there are two ways for Palestinians to understand the fact that Algerian-style terrorism keeps failing for them to deliver the Algerian result. The first way is that everything they have ever known about us is wrong that we're a nation of refugees with nowhere to go, and therefore every sacrifice they have ever made and every cruelty they have ever inflicted was stupid, which is much worse than being immoral, was self-defeating, or that they just haven't tried hard enough, they haven't massacred enough, they haven't been cruel enough. Hamas on October 7th went with the second version. It's trying harder. It wants to draw us into a war of cruelty that will test the theory that we can be pushed out to the limit.
that's what it tried to do and and that's what we're still living with right now we're it, it is still waiting and watching or planning to inflict on us more in cruelties push us into more rounds of fighting hopefully start a multi-front war anything to convince israelis they cannot live here and have to leave that's what i think it was about talk to us about the hamas ideology as distinct from the broader palestinian cause against israel so i think you, you were on another podcast where you talked about the connections between their ideology and that of isis and al-qaeda i think a lot of americans have thought that the war on what we call here the war on terror is over the isis caliphate was defeated afghanistan would fought to a draw now the taliban have taken over but they're sort of contained in afghanistan again we don't have to worry about the middle east anymore and islamic radicalism anymore and draw the line between what happened in israel this week in september 11 2001 and the broader struggle against islamic radicalism yeah when i try to interpret a society any society my own society you know i don't start with these kinds of constructs of of understanding sort of a categorizing ideologies i try and ask myself what problem are people experiencing what problem do they think they're solving the muslim world for the last 150 years has been asking a question what the hell happened to us? Why are we so weak? Why are we so behind? There have been many answers to this question. This is a question that has occupied the, the greatest thinkers and intellectuals of the Muslim world for the last 150 years. And, and one of the major answers that have been given to this question is an answer that says what happened to us was that we abandoned the old ways, the old religion, the good Islam, the Islam that was more important to a Muslim than his nation or his culture or his language. And when Islam was organized as this larger Islamic, pan-Islamic caliphate kind of framework, it was a conquering, successful, not just conquering geographically, but it, it, it overwhelmed cultures and, and reshaped them in its image. All over the world, you, know, you know, from Afghanistan to Morocco to Spain. And then Islam divided into small, established itself into these much smaller kingdoms and empires. And then imperialist Europeans came and subdivided into nation states, whatever the heck that is, right? Invented something called Iraq, invented something called Lebanon. And so if we break down those boundaries and those barriers and we return to that old piety and that old universality, we'll get our mojo back, so to speak. That very, very you know, a cartoonishly simple outline of an answer to what the heck happened to Islam. Why are we behind the West? Why are we so far behind? Has is percolated into all the many different branches of Islam in one way or another. Shia Iran is extremely different from the Sunni versions of this Islamic renewal theology. But it shares that basic understanding of history and understanding of the path to redemption facing you know islamic weakness explaining islamic weakness in the face of western success and so you have this kind of alliance and by the way if you are worried and constantly exercised by this problem of why is islam so weak why is islam so backward in such measurable ways israel is feels to you never you know most israelis come from the middle east right 20 percent of our population are arab israelis uh 50 of the jewish population come from the arab and muslim world most of us come from the arab and muslim world something like 70 percent of the population 30 percent comes from europe but in the arab world we're 100 percent europe in the, in the in the sort of this muslim vision of us to be to make us colonialists we have to all be europeans because the iraqis who fled iraq in 1951 couldn't be colonialists so we have to all be europeans but in this vision of us we are a kind of a kind of symbol a kind of uh, avatar for the entire vastness of the problem and that's why you have phenomena like dr mahathir muhammad who is the prime minister of malaysia for many many years obsessively talking about Israel, obsessively talking about Jews. He doesn't have a border with Israel. He doesn't have a, a nuclear program Israel's worried about. He has probably never met Israelis. He's certainly, you know, if he's met Jews, he don't, I don't think he liked them because he thinks Jews control the world. And he's given speeches about it on the world stage. But why does he even care? Why does he, being prime minister of Malaysia is a, is a, 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 a I've been told is a, is a busy job. I mean, why does he think about Jews at all? And the answer is that Israel is a kind of avatar for this larger 
what is happening to Islam. The Palestinians are Muslim and weak, and Israel is this, you know, I don't know, Western Judeo Christian, whatever, and a colonialist and strong. And so here is sort of played out that entire morality play. It's why Algerians think about us and 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 Malaysians think about us. And that aspect, that sort of basic sort of framing of it is shared by Hamas and Iran and Hezbollah, even though their their religions are very different. These are radically different kinds of Islam, radically different kinds of Sharia. They understand the redemptive arc of history in radically different ways. If there wasn't an Israel here, they'd be in each other's throats, literally. Um, but 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 that great, vast, overwhelming question, what the heck is happening to Islam? We are the answer we, through us. We are vocabulary for them working through that answer and destroying us is the path to that redemption for both of them. And so they're allies, at least for that project. So Al Qaeda is part of, you know, when it, defined in that very broad sense of that sort of basic understanding of how Islamic redemption hap will happen, must happen. Uh, Al Qaeda and Hamas and Shia, you know, Iran are all uh, the same, but there are profound differences within Palestinian society where Hamas represents that half of the conversation of the Muslim world conversation of that Islamic renewal theology conversation. And then there's another faction people probably have heard of called Fatah. That's the faction that's in charge of the Palestinian Authority and, and the Palestinian controlled areas of the West Bank. And Fatah ostensibly, many, many members of Fatah, probably a majority of Fatah's leadership even, is Islamist in that sense, in the sense of an Islamic politics of the Hamas type. But Officially, Fatah is nationalist. It's much, much more based on the other answer to what the heck happened to Islam, which is an answer that many, many Muslim thinkers have been giving for a century, which is the, the West created over the last 400 years, basically since the Peace of Westphalia, these fascinating institutions, these massively empowering institutions, for example, the modern state or the university, or and these institutions have given them superpowers of, of bureaucracy and organization and, and, and scholarship. And, and so if we adopt those institutions, we will be empowered. So the very thing that the Islamic you know, renewal part of Islam says destroyed us, divided us and weakened us, this, you know, let's modernize, let's take on these institutions, empowered us. And, 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 and so Fatah belongs to that half. I'm sorry to make it so, you know, broad and sweeping to the point where, you know, there's so many exceptions, but it's, I think it's basically right. Fatah belongs to that half. Fatah is a nationalist movement, very much models itself and thinks about and talks about the FLN of Algeria and really just thinks in anti-colonial terms, just like those college students we've been seeing screaming on college campuses think about this conflict where if you terrorize them, they will leave. And so Fatah has that very narrow sort of decolonial they read the first chapter of Franz Fanon's The Wretched of the Earth. They forgot to read all the other chapters where it all collapses, but they, they did read that first chapter, which is very important to at least get through the first chapter of any book you read. Those guys are Fatah, and then Hamas in combines that anti-colonial decolonization discourse. We will terrorize them until they leave, just like in Algeria, with this vast sweeping Islamic you know, renewal project. Khaviv, we're talking a lot about ideology. We're talking a lot about history. So one thing that, that a lot of us have been talking about here, but I have not spoken with an Israeli about, is the intelligence failure, the military failure. And obviously there's going to be a commission of inquiry. Obviously there's going to be a much deeper dive into this. But I have to tell you, while I've, you know, I've, I've, been disappointed in the quality of some of the Mossad and Shinbeck developments over the last few years. I would never have thought that a fail of this magnitude would have even been possible. What happened? It's much too early to know for sure. So I am going to venture completely irresponsibly and forward without any kind of sure Please knowledge. Do. I'm a journalist. We're allowed to do that. It looks like I also speak from my own experience, being a soldier, being an infantryman on the borders. What's astonishing isn't that they took out all of our sensors all at once, that they had a careful, you know, it's a, it's a level of competence we never, we've never seen in Hamas. And so we didn't expect, but the enemy will always surprise you. The first thing they teach you in your tactics classes and basic training is that all your plans, all your plans survive right up until you meet the enemy. That's when all your great battle plans fall apart. 
by definition, your battle plan survives right up until the moment you meet the enemy who's been doing nothing but planning to subvert your plans, right? So the Hamas could surprise us with an extremely competent multi-front assault across the border on all the sensors, you know, the, the cameras, the, the thermal, the, I think there's seismic sensors that were taken out that are meant to detect, you know, tunnel digging. That's not shocking. What's shocking is that when all the sensors were gone, there, was, there were no grunts. There were no simple soldiers. There, was, there, were, there, were, there were no battalions, right? There were, the Israeli borders are patrolled by infantry. And the infantry were gone. And it, it appears to, to me, again, with intellectually irresponsible and unfair, you know, point to do this now is just... But, as far as I can tell from what I have been following, and I've been following very closely... Hamas, the Israeli military and the Shabak had a theory that this technology was going to solve all its problems. And the technology was how they had done astonishing, had astonishing successes in intercepting weapons to Hezbollah in the Iraqi desert and, and, and destroying the Iranian nuclear program, major pieces of it again and again and again, and cyber, and they had invested in this and built it out and have astonishing capabilities. And by the way, they're still going to surprise us. In this war, they're going to be astonishing successes to all these intelligence apparatuses. But on the ground, on the border, in sort of the kinetic environment, the environment of actual fighting, battlefield fighting, they, they had gotten so used to the technology and so addicted to the technology that they forgot to actually put a bunch of grunts on the ground to swing into action if everything fell apart. And I was in the army, in the infantry 20 years ago, and 20 years ago, the one thing everybody understood was the infantry fights that battle when the enemy surprises us. There are still tank battalions in the Israeli army. Nobody's attacked us with tanks in generations. But they, they might, and they might, and if we get rid of the tanks... They're going to start seeking out tank battles because we won't have any tanks to fight them with. And so you build an army for the wars you expect. You try your best to build them for the wars you don't expect. And everybody forgot that. They got so clever, so smarmy, so dependent on technology, so impressed with their own cleverness that they didn't notice the giant hole in the middle of it all. Well, you know, we also have to remember that we're dealing with enemies who are very comfortable living in the 19th century. I mean, you know, Bin Laden evaded capture because he used couriers. And we were only able to ca find him when we figured that out and found the courier. So the idea that that we could protect Israel, protect the United States purely with technology, we should have learned that lesson <laughs> from from the last 20 years of the war on terror. But I want, I want to ask you about something else. I want to ask you about Palestinian support for Hamas. So, you know, we're hearing that the vast majority of Palestinians do not support Hamas. They're, they're outliers and all the rest of it. I've seen polls show, I mean, well, the, Hamas won an election in Gaza. What do the polls show us? Do Palestinians writ large want peaceful coexistence with Israel or do they support Hamas's ideology and its desire to destroy and drive Israel out of the region? And what does that mean for the broader strategy of how to deal with this problem? That's a very good question. It's not that we don't know. It's that all the things seem to be true all at once. When we ask Palestinians, I have seen polls in the West Bank consistently for more than a decade in which Hamas wins just about every election, just about every poll, just about every way you phrase it, Hamas wins that election. And that's why, of course, Mahmoud Abbas, the Palestinian president, won't hold an election. And he's in, I think it's the 18th year of a four-year term that's how, you know, people who don't like him keep saying it, both in, um, among Israelis and among Palestinians. But Hamas also hasn't held an election in Gaza since 2006, and for the same reason. There are polls in Gaza that indicate that Palestinians would vote Fatah. In other words, wherever Palestinians live, they'd vote for the other guy. Palestinians are aware that their polities have been decimated by their own political factions, which are corrupt and violent and tyrannical. And that doesn't take away at all from their hatred of Israel. They, they, they feel boxed in by a, a disastrous, you know, an, a terrible enemy Israel and this catastrophic political elite on both, both sides, Hamas and Fatah. So it, that's a baseline. The baseline is Palestinians don't like their leadership, don't trust their leadership, are horrified by what their leadership does to them. And also there's this evil Israel looming over them. What do they think of Hamas? When Hamas causes them pain and suffering and trouble, they hate it. When Hamas seems to 
be able to manage affairs in ways that make their lives a little better. Aid money comes in, there's a period of quiet. The support for Hamas seems to rise a little bit. But that's all very much minor because, of course, Hamas is a, a dictatorial, a tyrannical movement and does not ask the people what they think. The interesting question is, what do they think about terrorism? What, about, what do they think about murdering Israeli civilians? And we have Palestinian polls on this, from Palestinian pollsters. Murdering Israeli civilians, and I mean, I mean in that in that way. I mean, people say, "What do you think about you know the resistance killing Israeli non-combatant civilians?" That's the question, and that is a majority support among Palestinians. You can respect it as a function of the conflict, which, of course, many college students, it turns out, do. You can be horrified at it. You can feel any emotion you want to feel about it, but that is a fact. There, it appears, and this is from Khalil Shikaki's polls. He's the most prominent Palestinian pollster, uh, who's I think used by Gallup when they poll Palestinians. Support for terrorism is 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 actually very very high. I wish I you know, I wish I had the numbers here in front of me, but people can look it up. Uh, he has a center called the uh, Ipcri I P C R I in Ramallah. Um, and again, this is a uh, research center of Palestinian public opinion, trusted by Israelis, uh, trusted by American pollsters, trusted by Palestinian leaders. He's the partner of the International Republican Institute as a pollster, so he's trusted in the United States as well as in in Israel. Uh, right, he's right, the, and um, very serious people. And, and 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 so those are findings that that show that there is widespread support for terrorism. What he has shown over the years. And I take a lot of I take a lot of um, strength from these findings. Is that Palestinian support both for terrorism and for two states depends on, uh, to some significant extent on the Palestinian perception of what Israelis want. And so Palestinians believe Israelis want to destroy them. And when you ask a question, when when you say to Palestinians, "Do you think Israelis want to destroy you?" and then you say to them, "Do you think there should be a Jewish state?" using the word Jewish next to a Palestinian state. Uh, there's a very heavy correlation between people who think Israel wants to destroy them and people who say, no, there shouldn't be a uh, uh, Jewish state. And then when you ask a follow-up question, um, he's done this in qualitative uh, polling over the years. What if Israel recognized a Palestinian state? Would you then recognize a Jewish state? And it wasn't a, a huge majority, but I think he did have either a very large plurality or a slight majority said yes. And he has those findings among, his, among Palestinians. And we have findings among Israelis that are similar. You ask Israelis, do you support a Palestinian state? The majority, even large majority, say no. And then you say to them, well, what if it were safe? And then suddenly you have a majority yes. And then you say to them, well, will it ever be safe? And then you have a majority no. And so there is, Khalil Shikaki has argued over the years that there is a peace buried deep in the conditionals, uh, in these conditional follow-up questions. Uh, and so these questions are complicated. The short answer is Palestinians think Israel's, you know, they're under attack from Israel and therefore support terrorism. Um, we're talking about ordinary Palestinians. We're talking about working class, simple Palestinians who are not part of these elites. Hamas and Fatah represent a small section of Palestinian society that are elites and very ideal, ideologized elites. And among them, you have these great Islamic wars and these great anti-colonial wars. And uh, But among ordinary Palestinians, it's a much more, you know, are they for me? Are they against me? Are they hurting me? Are they not hurting me? And there is a peace there. I think that's also true in Israel. In other words, I think among Israelis, there is a sense that we tried peace again and again. And then we tried this right-wing idea of unilateral withdrawal to see if we can get a peace even after the mass terrorism of the Second Intifada. And that failed in the Second Lebanon War with mass death and terror and rivers of blood when tens of thousands of rockets raining down in our cities, hundreds of thousands of Israelis fleeing their homes. And for what? Why did Hezbollah, six years after we pulled out of Lebanon, shoot tens of thousands of rockets at us while we're smashing Lebanon? In other words, what did they get out of it except the smashing of Lebanon? And because we can't deter them, because we don't understand their violence, Israelis concluded that there is no peace available if the if the sense of implacable threat changes on both sides there is still in public opinion on both sides a peace i don't know what to make of that i'll just leave it here as a horrible it's, frustrating it, well, thing no uh, to the contrary it is 
the eternal silver linings crowd in Washington, the professional peace processors who haven't evolved uh, in their views since 1993 and probably not since 1975 uh, or 79 when Camp David was signed, who eternally hark back to that in the desperate hope that the circumstances they believed existed 20, 30, 40 years ago still exist now. And the answer is no, it's a different place. But that's not what I wanted to ask you. Uh, no, but let me, let me say something. But let me just agree. With, okay, go it ahead. It is a different place. It, no, it is a different place. And and I, the problem of those peace processes what they, was that when you're a diplomat, the whole world looks like diplomacy. And, and, you know, it's a little bit like when you're, there's a saying in Hebrew, maybe we stole it from English, I don't know. When you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And the problem they've had is that... <laughs> yes, you did steal it from elite, English. <laughs> Okay, so the elites of, of Palestinian society are so deeply ideologized that there isn't a peace with them. But ordinary Palestinians really are responsive to their sense of the Israeli threat. And ordinary Israelis are deeply responsive to their sense of the Palestinian threat. And therefore, there is a reconciliation possible uh, there. Now, it, because Israel is a democracy, Israeli politics is responsive to ordinary opinion in a way that Palestinian politics are not responsive to popular opinion in that way. So I wanted to ask you, and I, I know we've kept you longer than we promised, which we always do, I should add. The talk of Washington is is actually uh, obviously shock and horror at what has happened to our friend, our ally in Israel, but also a much bigger question about Iran. In my conversation with colleagues on different sides of the aisle, there is agreement I'm not sure if it's correct, but there's agreement at least that Israel is downplaying Iran, not talking about Iran at the senior most levels, not agitating. And I, I watch every single bit of Israeli social media and, and, and the military's work as well. They're not talking about Iran. And one of the main reasons for that, our analysts suggest, is because Israel wants to take this challenge on sequentially. Israel wants to deal with Gaza. First, it does not want to, it doesn't want a two front war with Hezbollah and Lebanon. It doesn't want to start the war of even of wars with Iran right now. But here's the, the, the existential question, right? Hamas would not exist in the form that it exists in without Iran. And even if Israel goes in and decapitates, even if Israel goes in and takes out every single military operator, Every single military operator, every mastermind in Gaza for Hamas, and maybe even goes, well, does what I want them to do, which is goes into Qatar and gets rid of their political leadership as well. There'll still be Iran to rebuild, to help continue Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad's existence, much as after 2006, Hezbollah rebuilt itself bigger, stronger, better. How, 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 what do we do? How do we talk about this? Are you talking about this? Are our theories wrong? What's your reaction? The Israeli chief of staff went to bed on October 6th believing that the various enemies on our borders are essentially deterrable. It's complicated, not always. There'll be low-intensity low conflicts, but they're deterrable. And the Israel that woke up on October 8th, after those 24 hours, no longer believes that. The Israel that woke up on October 8th, the day after the massacre, understands that the 10 or 15 years, whatever it was that we bought of not quite quiet, but certainly not, you know, all out war was, was as I, as people have been telling me and I've been telling others, you know, that the translated from the Hebrew was bought on credit. And when the bill came due, it, it was, it was too big to, to bear. It was too painful. And so Israel can no longer afford that kind of quiet, the quiet that is on credit. And that translates into a very, very clear understanding of Hezbollah. It translates into a very clear understanding of the Syrian militias in Syria that are utterly and totally controlled by Iran and are there for that war in which Iran is able to open as many fronts as it can. And the Houthis in Yemen and the militias in Iraq the chief of staff of the state of Israel, when he woke up on the morning of October 8th, assuming he slept that night, 
woke up to a, a, a world of clarity. Iran's strategy of the death of a thousand cuts, so to speak, of having forcing a small war here and a small conflict there and a small terror attack here and a small... That Iranian strategy has surrounded us. And it resulted, you know, every Jew alive remembers Kishinev. I always joke, I tell, I literally, you'll meet random in the Jewish community in Minnesota. Apologies to Minnesota Jews for using them as the example of, you know, random far-flung Jewish community, but, you know, they're in Minnesota. And you tell them Kishinev, and they don't know why they know it, but they know it. They know that that's a word that means something big and dramatic and agonizing in, in Jewish history. Kishinev was about four dozen dead. Hamas just gave us 25 Kishinevs. Hamas just gave us a moment that, that the Jews will remember forever. And if that doesn't result in an upending of the region, if that doesn't lead to such catastrophic costs for Hamas, for Hezbollah, for Iran, for all the enablers, for this strategy of surrounding and the death of a thousand cuts, if Israel can't respond to that in ways that make them wish otherwise, in the Yom Kippur War, which everyone's comparing this moment to, it's interesting to follow the UN Security Council resolutions on the war, because in the first day of the war, when we're losing, and the Syrians are off the Golan and down in the valley, and the Egyptians have crossed the canal, the UN is silent. Second day of the war, there's a turnaround, the reserves have reached the battlefield, the UN is silent. But even after Israel's won, basically, there's still a few battles, important battles left to fight, but Israel's basically won a few days in. Israel continues for two extra weeks. Massive bombardment of the Syrian industrial base. I don't think the Syrian industrial base had reached, had returned to its pre-73 level by the time the civil war broke out in 2011. And then you see this massive torrent. I think there are five UN Security Council resolutions calling for a ceasefire. Suddenly Israel has to stop. Israel exacted a cost. Israel was shocked. It was thrown back. There was an existential threat. And then it exacted a cost that made the Syrians never threaten us across that border again. And it wasn't a deterrence of Hezbollah kind of cost. It wasn't we'll fight a few low-intensity conflicts kind of cost. It reshaped the environment. Just this Monday, nobody has any idea what they're planning. Nobody knows what the chief of staff is planning, what the generals are planning, what the uh, security cabinet is planning. All of the sort of incompetent and um, unfortunate politicians who now sit in our uh, cabinet uh, and routinely leak cabinet meetings, none of them are included in that five-member war cabinet. So there's actually serious you know, secrecy about Israeli war plans. But the call-up that just happened was the largest call-up in the history of the IDF. There's something like 350,000 men called up. The whole country is mobilized, and every single Israeli, my wife's good friend and colleague, Shaked Haran, had 11 members of her family, including her sister and parents and her three-year-old niece, taken hostage by Hamas. My wife has been running that family's, or helping to run in a group of volunteers, that family's media campaign, and has been on CNN and Indian television and German television. For that, for those people, my close friend was in the CSI. I have two of my wife's brothers are now at the front. There isn't a family not touched by this, not touched by the massacre, not touched by the war that is to come. There just isn't one. We're completely normative, normal Israelis. We don't know extra numbers of soldiers or everybody knows people. And this is a this population, the Israeli population, has given this government infinite credit, infinite time, and. We had one little indication of the thinking, of the shift, of the profound shift. Israel has not, no idea what it's going to do in Gaza after Hamas. It doesn't need to know what it's going to do after Hamas, because it knows something more important. Hamas cannot survive this. That is more important. The U.S. didn't entirely know what it was going to do with Japan after the war, but it knew that Japan, that could threaten California for quite a bit of that war, will not be this Japan. There'll have to be a different Japan because this Japan can't survive. Monday, yesterday, Ronen Bar, the head of the Shin Bet, the Shabak Security Service, the Domestic Security Service, sent a letter to the employees of this agency. Their one job is to detect terrorism. And so that, 
the failure, the, the, the intelligence failure at its deepest level comes from the Shabak. Oninbal, in this letter to his employees, said, we failed as an organization. And then he said, and that responsibility for our failures in organization comes to me. It, I'm the one who failed. I'm the one who didn't provide the, the warning that this was coming. And then he, seven paragraphs down in this letter, almost entirely unnoticed by the media, he has this little paragraph, a couple sentences. He says, there's going to be time for investigations. Now we fight. And then he says, we're in a war, not another round of fighting. A round is one with an image of victory and by achieving quiet. A war ends with a decisive victory and a completely altered situation. There are no limits to the borders. There are no limits to time. This is to the end. That is a letter written by the head of the Shabak to his employees about what is now happening in Israel. It's the first time I've seen an Israeli leader, not out of bombast, not out of, oh, we're going to bring the gates of hell to Hamas, etc. But Hamas started with the gates of hell talk, so Israel replied, right? But that that is the Israeli mindset now. In other words, nothing else matters. It doesn't matter what the exit strategy is, and it doesn't matter anything. The only thing that matters is that either the state of Israel can make Jewish blood expensive, it can destroy these enemies who want to destroy us, or it can't. And so it is now going to prove that it can. I believe there's going to be a war in the north, so much so that it's possible it begins before the Gaza ground invasion. Why not? That's a strategic surprise. Israel has to offer strategic surprise. I have no idea why the aircraft carriers are here. No one has offered me an explanation, I believe. I don't think America needs... One is a message. Maybe it's not that busy. Two? Two is not a message. Israel is going wild. It doesn't look like it because it's standing still. But internally, I think Israel has gone a little bit crazy uh, with what happened, with the helplessness of it all, and with the sense that we have to restore our own belief in our agency. And I think that the Biden administration isn't so much supporting, although it is absolutely supporting. It wants Israel to fight back. It wants this to be a turnaround against Iran, if only because there's a larger Cold War to think about with China, and Iran and China are on one side, and the Israelis and the Americans on the other. And so America wants Israel to win this, and for this to be a pivot against Iran in the region. But the bear hug that we're seeing, Secretary of State Blinken in the war cabinet today, why? President Biden coming tomorrow? You can talk to me about solidarity, but that's very silly. What, what's, what can he do here that he can't do there? The bear hug we're seeing is the sense that the Israelis might go out of control. And if they're going to go out of control, let them go out of control with us, because then it won't be too far out of control. Rather than letting them go out of control without us, Israel has the firepower to do immense things in the Middle East, and America would like that to be productive and maybe not out of trauma. So that's the American sense. And there, I take I t the American massive investment, which really has no, ex there's nothing those aircraft carriers can do in Hez Hezbollah. There's just no tactical relevance to Gaza with those carrier groups. It's about Iran. I'm not sure that it's about deterring Iran. I want to ask you, why are you not sure it's about deterring Iran? What do you think the purpose might be? I think there's a desperate desire in the Israeli leadership to create strategic surprises. Painful strategic surprises, shocking strategic surprises. I think that there's a sense that something big has gone wrong, not a not a tactical mistake, not a not an over reliance on technology, not the little things. We no longer set, we would today's Israel do the Antebi raid. Would today's Israel initiate and have that level of not just initiative but daring? And that level of strategic surprise. Moshe Dayan used to speak about the wounded tiger. Israel must be a wounded tiger. A wounded tiger is an incredibly, is a much more dangerous animal than a healthy tiger because out of fear, wounded tigers will lash out insanely. It's better to be a wounded tiger for your deterrence than, than, than to be a healthy tiger. I think there was a transformation. This is a different country. The public is different. If the political class doesn't now, I don't, I don't have security clearance, and the generals don't talk to me. If they don't, if they're not in that headspace that the Israeli public is at, 
then they will be replaced with someone who is. In other words, that that is what the Israeli public feels, needs. I think that's what's also what's happening. It explains the delay. It explains the sense that there's a tremendous amount of time. We're not on anybody else's schedule. We don't care about the political window of the world. You want to sanction us? This is the time. Enjoy it. Have fun. We're not going to notice. Some, this is a different Israel. And, and, and I think that the Biden administration's bear hug reflects that, reflects fear of that, or at least a sense that that has to be a little bit reined in so that it doesn't overdo it. Talk to us about, I want to, I want to get a broader lesson that we should learn here in the United States. We all saw the videos of Hamas, that Hamas put out themselves, digging up water pipelines that had been provided to them with foreign aid and turning them into rockets. And I think it's emblematic of what I think is the biggest foreign policy blunder of the post-Cold War era, which is that we could somehow turn tyrants into Democrats, that we could somehow, through engagement, get them to become responsible members of the international community through aid, through trade, through the promise of, of a better life, uh, and all the rest of it. I think the most overused phrase in turn-of-the-century foreign policy was the statement that China has a choice to make. Iran has a choice to make. <laughs> Russia has a choice to make. Yes. North Korea has a choice yeah. to make. Hamas has a choice to Israel. make. Israel. The irres responsible members of the international community or, you know, suffer the consequences of being outcasts and all the rest of it. And they already right. made their choice before the question was asked. And so, you know, we were just, you know, we just had a situation where the Biden administration was giving $6 billion to Iran in exchange for hostages and trying to bring them into the nuclear accord again. And, you know, Russia, you know, we just a few years ago, I was with, with President Bush at NATO summits where we were bringing Putin into the summit meetings and, you know, say, floating the prospect of being a partner with NATO. And now he's invaded Ukraine. I mean, is the lesson of all this that terrorists and tyrants are evil men and that evil men are never going to be responsible members of the international community and how should that how should that affect our our policy going forward what is the broader lesson for us and and the the western world the democratic world in engaging with tyrants and terrorists i think that americans suffer i say this with truly immense love but americans suffer from a, a failure of imagination americans have a deep faith in ordinary things. It's a little bit like how Tolkien describes hobbits. They don't have great redemptive messianic ideologies. And they don't really believe, as, as a kind of civic religion, they don't have cults of personality. They, they accuse each other of having them, but they don't. <laughs> but So they have a hard time imagining the... The people who do. They have a hard time believing that, or imagining someone who genuinely, authentically believes that there is a divine arc to history, and that that arc calls them to do things that are painful and cruel and difficult, but otherwise the divine plan for history won't be carried out. That can sound very silly in English. It didn't used to sound silly in English. It used to be something that uh, people believed also in the Christian West. But maybe it's modernity, maybe it's post-World War II, maybe it's 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 many, many things. Um, and so Americans have a hard time imagining it. The, the enemies America faces do actually expect, how shall I put this, they're exactly what they claim they are. Hamas is a, is a movement of profound faith and piety. It really is. Its leadership has grown a little corrupt in Gaza, but that's recent. Its leadership used to be really genuinely bottom-up, working-class people. Ismail Haniyeh's first time when he was prime minister, he took a flight from Gaza City to Cairo to have some indirect talks with the Israelis. That was the first time he was ever on a plane. He wasn't the Fatah smarmy elite sipping champagne in, in, in Geneva with uh, international you know, diplomats. And so... Hamas has had has this profound and real and, and deep-seated belief. There is an arc to history. God is on their side. And if they can sacrifice enough, and part of their sacrifice is their cruelty. That was one of the things that they feel is that they're losing 
is is their innocence in order to make the great plan come true. They're taking that on themselves, and so they believe it. When you talk to the Chinese government, that's much more a cult of personality than it is any kind of redemptive, you know, arc to history kind of ideology. But the Chinese government really does think what it thinks. There is a there is a deep roots in in Confucianism there. I don't want to badmouth Confucianism by comparing it to the current Chinese regime, but some of some of the sort of cultural assumptions on which this Chinese regime can survive and can run that country the way it runs it has roots in that kind of deep seated religious culture. And that and 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 so that America has a hard time imagining extremely different people. Jews know this, by the way. Americans always talk about Anne Frank as a model of the Jews killed in the Holocaust. 85% of the Jews killed in the Holocaust spoke Yiddish. They weren't Anne Frank. But Anne Frank is much, much easier for an American to imagine because she was Western and she wrote diaries. And she, and the Jews of the East, the Yiddish-speaking Jews, are not easy to imagine. And so Americans live in a world in which they constantly see, every, they constantly see themselves in everyone else. Right now, a lot of Palestinian supporters look out at Hamas and they look out at Gaza from America and they just see really kind of nice Americans who are in this awful situation. And there isn't that sense that maybe some deep differences, some profound differences, maybe there is agency among those Palestinians for their for what's happening to that. You can believe Israel is terribly, terribly wrong, but 90% wrong, not 100%. You know, maybe there is something that they can do to correct. Maybe Hamas is actually awful for Palestinians. It's fascinating to me that the pro-Palestinian movement is unable to summon critique of Hamas, which is astonishing because Hamas massacres Palestinians. And yet there is no ability, there's no cultural ability, political ability, because there's this kind of lack of imagination that maybe something happening over there is different from, from what I am and from how I think. So that is something I urge Americans, left and right, I have to say left and right to be polite, to you know get over and to be able to look at an Iranian and hear an Iranian leader say, America's the great devil and the Mahdi is coming and we're going to destroy you and we're going to do it slow because we don't have the power right now because God asked us to do it slow and believe him. Hugely wise words, uh, Habib, and I agree with every single word. Thank you. Habib, thank you. That great. was so fascinating. Such a great conversation. We're so grateful to you. We could, we told you we're going to keep you for about half an hour and we now over an hour and I could have gone for another hour. We hope you'll come back again. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. All right. Take care. Danny, what do you think? So, we didn't talk a lot about this uh, because we were talking about what happened in Israel and about the scene on the ground and about the, the conflict. But at a certain point, we must begin to be more serious about Iran because what I said in the podcast is so true. It doesn't matter whether you kill everybody in Hamas. It doesn't matter whether you kill their political cadre as well. Well, it does. With, with, well, no, no. I mean, <laughs> yes, 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 absolutely. It does. But for the, for, it's a first step. But for the long term, like Hezbollah, if we do not deal with this evil at the heart of the Middle East, the regime in Tehran, they will re- they will find new Hamases. They will find new people to support. They will find new murderers to train, and this will happen again. And that is really the, the challenge that we, the United States, have to contend with. Because one of the things I said early on about this is a hundred percent true, and that is sure they came first for the Jews, but they'll come for us. You're a hundred percent correct, and I think that what we really need is a fundamental reassessment. I, I agree with you 100%, Danny, but I'll, I'll take it even a step further, which is that we need a fundamental reassessment of our efforts to engage and try to appease totalitarian regimes writ large. The biggest failure of Western foreign policy in the post-Cold War era is this idea that we can convince Vladimir Putin and the Ayatollahs and Kim Jong-un and, and the leaders of Hamas to be responsible actors on the world stage. It's just not possible. Evil people are evil, and evil people will do evil things. And there is no way to entice them with, you know, foreign aid, trade, 
engagement, uh, money, cash bribes, whatever, whatever things have been tried, bringing, you know, Russia into a partnership with NATO, uh, uh, looking into their souls. They don't have souls. That doesn't mean that we have to go and, and go to war with everybody, <laughs> but we need to contain and deter them. And the only way you're going to convince them not to do the evil things they plan to do is not by making them promises of better lives for their citizens or other things like that. It's to make their goals impossible to achieve. And the way you do that is by building alliances of free nations, by building the, the kind of military that can deter them from acting, by, by having policies of deterrence that, sh that they will credibly believe that if they take certain steps that they want to take, that they will pay a cost that is unacceptable to them for doing those things. Our whole foreign policy has to change um, because we have now seen Russia invade Ukraine. We've seen Iran start a war in the Middle East, and we have China on the brink of wanting to start a war in, in the Pacific. If we don't change the way we're approaching these things, we've got to get serious. We have to recognize that engaging them is fruitless and that we need to deter them. And we made we, that means credible, a credible show of will. That's why we can't lose in Ukraine. That's why we can't lose in the war in Hamas, because, because China's going to look at that and say the West is weak and now's my time to move. And we have to rebuild our frigging military. We have to put the, the resources into, into building our defenses and our capabilities as such that no one would dare to challenge us or our allies or our interests around the world. That's the only way you get these people to stop behaving in these ways. Ideally, you want the regime in Iran to fall. You want people to rise up and take it, take it down. But if that's not going to happen, we have to put them in a box they can't get out of. We need to starve them of resources. We need to put sanctions on them that are so crippling that they can that they that they can't fund Hamas, so they can't fund Hezbollah, like we had done for a period of time, or at least we're starting to do in the previous administration. When even the New York Times and the Washington Post reported, the maximum pressure sanctions were such that Iran was unable to pay Hezbollah fighters that they had previously paid, that the money wasn't coming. You know, that's not perfect. It would be better if the Iranian regime didn't work. But if they can't pay Hezbollah and they can't pay Hamas and they can't pay the Houthis and they can't provide them with weapons, that's better than, than giving them $6 billion <laughs> of fungible money that they can use to then uh, free up resources for terror. So we need to contain these regimes. We need to tighten the box on them and stop pretending that we can engage them and bring them into the civilized world. Amen to that, Mark. I agree with every single word you said. And you're hearing that from somebody who has always believed that we should first try to engage our adversaries. We tried. I, it's over. I, 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 a lot of things have been clarified for me in the last in the last couple of weeks. I can tell you that, folks. Uh, Mark is doing amazing work. Uh, please read our Substack. We're trying to update it frequently. Share your ideas and thoughts with us. And thanks so much for listening. Take care. Let us know what topics you'd like us to cover. You can get in touch with the show by emailing us at whatthehell at aei dot org. Or you can reach us on Twitter. I'm at D. Pletka. And I'm at Mark Thiessen. That's Mark with a C. Please rate and review the podcast. If you like the show, please subscribe, share it, comment on Apple Podcasts, or wherever you're listening to this. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.